Hello and welcome to Global Healthcast, brought to you by Global Health Press. I am Joe Schmidt and with me is Dr. Melvin Sanikas. Good morning, Melvin. Good morning, Professor Schmidt. Good morning, everyone. Good afternoon or good evening, depending on where you're watching this Global Healthcast. And here you see Melvin and myself in some pencil sketches. And the topics we cover today is global COVID-19 situation, cases continue to decline. Then we cover a new prevention method for COVID-19, a combination of monoclonal antibodies. We cover why you should not use the term common cold. Everybody says this, but it's wrong. And we cover lack of immune response to SARS-CoV-2 in some infected children. And I think, Melvin, it's you to start with the current COVID situation. Yes, uh, thanks, Professor. So this again is from the World Health Organization COVID-19 situation report. They put this out every week. And I have to say that this is a week delayed because this is not real time, but these are the numbers reported to WHO um, and they're just reporting it as they receive them. So as of early June 2022, over 530 million confirmed cases and over 6.2 million deaths have been reported. But the number of new weekly cases has continued to decline since the peak in January 2022. And also the number of new deaths um, are continuing to um, decline. But this is the global picture overall. At the country level, the highest number of new weekly cases were reported from the United States, from China, Australia, Brazil, and, and Germany. And the Omicron variant of concern continues to be the dominant variant circulating globally, accounting for nearly all sequences reported to um, GSAID in the last 30 days. Um, and um, maybe something that not everyone knows is that Delta is now con considered by WHO as a as a previously circulating variant of concern. It's no longer considered a variant of concern. So in the same way that alpha, beta, and gamma are now considered previously circulating variant of concern, so we only have uh, Omicron now as the only variant of concern um, considered by the WHO. So, as we know, Omicron has several sub-variants, BA1, BA.1, BA.2, BA.4, BA.5. All these Omicron sub-variants are variants of concern. Very interesting. Um, I'm just wondering, the first news this morning when I woke up was that Germany has a summer wave. And there is really some concern that this may continue to increase, which is in contrast to the global situation that you just showed. Any insights on this or any comment? Yes, so um, globally we've seen that the cases are, are going down, but as I've mentioned, there are some countries like the US, China, Australia, Germany, and Brazil, where cases are um, going up again, and um, this is also due to the uh, BA.4 and BA.5 same sub-variant that is also causing cases um, in, in Portugal. Yeah, so um, I guess in the end, the numbers are globally declining, but you have to, for your local situation, to have to watch out what's happening in detail, right? So the yeah. details may matter, yeah? yeah? Very interesting. Thank you very much. Uh, great insights. And uh, I want to cover a little bit groups with reduced vaccine protection, and they are listed here. They are either people who are not really protected by vaccination or those who are at increased risk for exposure, heavy exposure. And in the first group is those who are old, who are obese, who have an immunocompromised status. If they receive chemotherapy, if they have an underlying disease, that results in no adequate immune response. There are quite a few reasons why you may not be well protected with vaccination based on factors in the host, in the human body. The second is the epidemiology. If you have a high infectious pressure, if you are exposed to very many viruses, the protection from a vaccine will not be enough. 
So these people or people in these two groups were randomized to receive a new product. What I would like to highlight, and we talk about that later, is this group on immunocompromised status, they are outstanding a little bit because many of them have no antibody response. They simply don't respond to the vaccine, like people who receive rituximab, a monoclonal antibody that stops your antibody response. In, in any way, there is this new product, which is a combination of two monoclonal antibodies, and they are neutralizing antibodies. And the interesting point here is in the development, they have a prolonged half-life of 90 days. So in the past, you needed to give antibodies you, you, you take antibodies from your laboratory or from other patients and you inject them into those who you want to protect. And then you have protection for a maximum of four weeks. Now, with some changes in the antibody, the half-life is extended to 90 days, which is a lot. It is basically three months, right? Mm -hmm. So this antibody was used in double-blind randomized controlled trial. And the comparator was placebo, and the placebo was saline. And if this new product was given to risk patients that I showed before, then in the placebo group, 1% of patients came down with symptomatic COVID compared to 02 who received the product. And you see the risk reduction is almost 80%. Mm -hmm. And the relative risk reduction is 82%. The adverse event, and that's so interesting, the placebo group, this is saline. It is water with a little bit of saline. The adverse event is almost identical in both groups, which is amazing to me, which tells you uh, whatever a doctor does, it has some side effects, even if he does nothing, right? So in the end, that's, a, that's an interesting story. But the good news is that it's really, it is working. Now, what are the concerns? The concerns are resistance. The immunocompromised host, if a person who has no immune response, he is sort of a breeding laboratory for the virus. Now you give this monoclonal, the antibody levels will fall, and at some point it will give way to mutations who escape the uh, monoclonal antibodies. And so the immunocompromised host, this population, if they receive it, in the long run, they may be the source for new mutants that are resistant to the drug. This is a concern. This is the mechanism similar that it works with antibiotic resistance. The second concern is a lesser concern. It is there is certainly no sterilizing immunity. It is only antibodies in the blood. You are not protected from infection. You are protected from severe disease. I think overall, this is very good news. Uh, the drug is well tolerated and it is really adding to our armamentarium to protect those at increased risk or those who are um, exposed to um, to the heavily exposed to SARS-CoV-2. Melvin, any questions or was there a clear communication this morning? No, I think it's pretty clear that this product is really working, as you see, as you can see with the risk reduction and the relative risk reduction. And, and for me, it's really interesting to see that um, saline and the product has similar uh, adverse events. So um, yeah. this is a good thing. Yeah, actually, I remember Haiti Peltola. He ran a study with twins and measles vaccination. And twins who received the placebo had the same side effects as those who received the measles vaccine. This is amazing, right? So uh, a lot to learn about the side effects of placebo. Mm -hmm. In any event, uh, Melvin, you have an interesting story and uh, I'm not sure how to introduce it, except saying that there seems to be a lack of immune response in some children after SARS-CoV-2. What, what is the story here? Yeah, um, so this is actually from Immunity. So this is a journal um, by Cell Press and it was published last week. Um, this is from a group at the University of Melbourne um, and the Murdoch Children's Research Institute in Australia. So they recruited children and adults who recovered from COVID-19 to really look at the circulating memory SARS-CoV-2 specific CD8 and CD4 T cells prior to vaccination. 
So the study showed that um, unvaccinated children who seroconverted had comparable spike specific but lower ORF1A and N specific memory T cell responses compared to adults. Um, what is interesting is that it's also it also showed that um, kids with COVID-19 uh, are able to mount a fast immune response that may limit immune memory. And because of this, not all kids develop immune memory. So I think it's a little bit um, it, it's a little bit strange, right? Because because of the fast immune response, they are not able to um, produce enough immune memory. Um, so the investigators are saying that this study supports COVID vaccines for kids. Um, it's also unknown from this study if those who did not seroconvert during the first infection also benefit from fast viral clearance um, with newer variants. And another important message for this study, I think it's just something that medical students have been hearing from pediatricians and pediatric professors over and over again, basically just saying that children are not small adults because the immune system of children is really different from, from adults. Interesting. Uh, and as you say, we have known this all the time. Um, in an adult, you have many more plasma cells and uh, uh, in children, we have more naive B cells. So there are differences in uh, what your immune cells are um, functional with or what, what, what they are able to do. I was not aware that there are such differences when it comes to memory. Uh, does the Melbourne group aim at looking if this has any relevance for protection, for the amount of protection, for the percentage of children who are protected or for the duration of protection? Or is this, uh, will this stay in the academic field? Look what happens in the immune response. I think it's more of really understanding the, the nuances between the immune response of children and adults because um, really the, the way uh, the, the the way forward to vaccinate them is a little bit different uh, from adults, right? And, and and for me, really, the other main thing from this study is that the fact that if the virus is cleared too fast from the system, like what's happening in children, then your immune memory is not able to develop, right? So I, I, I think it, it tells us um, how the, how infection should also stay for a certain amount of time in the body so that our immune system is able to develop immunity, immune memory to it. Yeah, usually all infections uh, or many infections occur for the first time in the first five years of life. Mm -hmm. In the past, it was diphtheria, pertussis, haemophilus influenza, so it was always first infections, influenza certainly, or yeah. SARS of two, if everybody has immunity due to vaccination or due to natural infection, then everybody's immune except newborns. So um, I guess uh, we the the the, uh, the pattern of infectious diseases of SARS CoV two will change over time, right? Definitely, yeah, yeah. Very interesting story. Uh, great, you picked that up. Thank you very much. And I just have one teaching point, I guess, uh, why you should not use the term common cold. And uh, to understand this, I want to take you to Spitzbergen. Spitzbergen is at the Atlantic Sea, close to the uh, pole, to the to the northern pole. It is really way up. I was there once with my friend Heike Peltola. And this is the view from the hotel outside in summer. It doesn't get dark in summer. Uh, and I guess for nine months, you don't have sunlight. But I was <laughs> there in summer and uh, I enjoyed the time. There isn't much to do. There is an airport uh, uh, since some time. So you can fly there. And uh, it, is, uh, it is a nice experience to, to stay there for a few days only. Right. And if you walk out, you should not walk out without a shotgun because of the polar bears that are walking around and they you, you are at risk if you walk around without a shotgun. In any event, this is the hospital, the long year being sick host. And uh, interestingly, what you can collect there is data on respiratory tract infections. And this is actually from the 1930s. What you see in blue is the temperature in long year being. It's always below zero. And then in summer, it is getting just above zero centigrade. 
And in the old days, that was the time when ships could come from Europe or the United States and they could pick up the charcoal that was produced on Longyearbyen. There are big reservoirs of charcoal and uh, there was a lot of mining in the 1930s. Ships could only come in summer and then all of a sudden there was a huge increase and you see the red bars in acute respiratory tract infections and that's the term you should use, ARI, acute respiratory tract infections. They all of a sudden soared and they declined again when, it, uh, when, when summer was over. And the reason is certainly with the ships, they came all the influenza, para-influenza, human metanoma virus, you name the respiratory viruses, they came with the ships. And they were introduced in a naive population. So everybody got sick in Long Yabin, or most people got sick at some point, I guess. But then when the charcoal ships had left, this was a community of 2,500, everybody was immune and there was no more respiratory tract infection introduced. The seasonal pattern and what we see about respiratory infections has to do with immunity. That is the most important denominator and with the size of the population. If you have a huge population that is traveling a lot and there's a lot of exposure, then you see respiratory tract infection in a certain pattern. They come in winter and they disappear in summer which is not well understood, but you have heard before that SARS-CoV-2 is now happening again during summertime. In the end, you need a certain number of a population for a respiratory virus to circulate. If the number is too small, then everybody's exposed, everybody's immune, and the virus disappears. That's the interesting story to tell you from uh, Spitzberg. And I guess that leads me then uh, to summarize that Melvin introduced the global COVID situation, numbers going down. We spoke about that this may be different locally. I showed you new data on a monoclonal antibody combination for the prevention of COVID-2 for certain groups only. I told you why you should not say the common cold and Melvin covered why there's a lack of immune response to SARS-CoV-2 in some infected children. Melvin, anything you would like to add? Anything I forgot? No, I think you covered it perfectly, Professor. Thank you very much then. Uh, I am Joe Schmidt and uh, with me was Melvin Sanikas and this was brought to you by Global Health Press. The TB ebook launch will be on June 22nd. If you want to be part of the launch, please write an email to daniela at globalhealthpress.org and you will receive an invitation. Thank you very much again, and we wish you a wonderful week. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Stay safe and always get your information from trusted sources.